everybody, welcome back to This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG, which is a regular video series discussing relevant and current topics in global health. In this episode, we are continuing our series featuring leading topics coming out of the latest publication from the Disease Control Priorities Network. And today we're going to focus on global cancer control and pediatric cancer. I'm Jessica Taff, and I'm hosting this show today from the Washington, D.C. metro area. And with me today, I have two experts on the issue. Helen and Sumit, could you please introduce yourselves, where you're from, um, what do you do related to global cancer control and or this, uh, this volume, this DDCP3 volume? I'm Helen Galband from the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, DC. I'm one of the editors and an author of several of the chapters in the DCP cancer volume. I work on a variety of global health policy issues, but I've spent many years uh, thinking about how to energize cancer control in poor countries, particularly getting past the often singular focus on prevention. And I'm Sumit Gupta. I'm a pediatric oncologist here at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Um, I've spent a number of years working and conducting research in low middle income countries on childhood cancer. And my area is really how childhood cancer can be uh, treated in resource constrained settings in a effective and cost effective way. Great, thank you. It's, I'm really happy to talk to you guys today. So in our last episode on essential surgery, we introduced um, our partners for the series, which is the Disease Control Priorities Network. Um, and just to remind you, the network engages hundreds of health experts to assess effectiveness, cost, and cost-effectiveness evidence for global health interventions. And they focus on different disease areas. Cancer is in it has its own volume, uh, and like I said, this is our discussion for today. Um, and if you want to find out more, you can look at the at the website, which is dcp-3.org. Now, let's get into this. But before we delve into how to control it, let's talk about the global cancer burden. So the stats from the WHO, International Agency for Research on uh, Cancer, indicate that in 2012, there were 14 million new cancer cases and 8 million deaths. And over half of these deaths are in individuals younger than um, age 70. Now, while high cancer burden is often associated with high income countries, this is actually wrong. Over three quarters of those deaths that I just mentioned under 70 were from lower middle income countries and cancer survival rates are actually lower in lower income groups. But the good news is that age standardized cancer death rates before age 70 have fallen about 1% each year between 2000 and 2010. But why we need to be talking about this is because the population keeps growing. It's going to continue doing that. And as that happens, the absolute number of cancer will continue to increase. So I want to talk to Helen first. Helen, since you're the editor of this volume, please tell us why you, you, know, there's, you dedicated an entire volume to talking about cancer as a health priority for the future. Well, there are a lot of reasons why we need to worry about cancer, but I want to start by saying that it's not just the future. We've ignored it in the past. It should have been a priority long ago, even though, as you said, people consider cancer as kind of an advanced country disease. It really isn't. Um, low and middle income countries have had some of the highest cancer rates for certain cancers, uh, especially those caused by infectious agents. and and even with lower life expectancies, that's translated into millions of deaths. Almost all the cases of cervical cancer today, which hits at younger ages than most cancer, and a large share of liver cancer and stomach cancer, um, have been in low and middle income countries for decades. And fortunately now, we have effective preventive measures for at least liver cancer and cervical cancer, and that will certainly help in decades to come. But um, cancer has a very long lag time, so a lot of women and men will be, will be suffering from these cancers um, in, the, in the coming decades. And, and for instance, cervical cancer is very treatable, liver cancer much less so. So if we don't do something for those people in the next few decades, they're going to just die. Eventually, these uh, preventive measures will kick in, these vaccines, basically. Um, but 
one of the things that's really important now is to kind of get over this prevention hump, which I, I mentioned before. We can't prevent our way out of this. Treatment, um, and, and Sumit can talk a lot about uh, the, the successes of childhood cancer treatment. Treatment, whether it's with the intent to cure or to palliate pain, is essential to ramp up now. And it's kind of the, the hump we need to get over. It's also vital to link with cancer control measures the cancer control measures with the coming of universal health coverage, uh, which helps to avoid impoverishing people um, who are, have to pay for their, their treatment themselves. So th those are some of the important new aspects. Great, yeah, that, that's all really important to consider um, for sure. But I wanna take this over to Sumit. Childhood cancer seems like an unusual priority for loan Middle income countries. Um, but why, why is this an important thing to focus on? Is there a really high burden there or higher death rates? Why do we need to focus on it? It seems unusual to a lot of people, including friends and families, and to many people in middle income countries as well. I get asked this question a lot. I think there's a couple of key things to remember. First is that thanks to Herculean efforts by many, many people, the traditional causes of childhood death, infectious causes, have actually decreased dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years in many, many countries around the world. And once infectious disease starts to come under control, the next most common cause of childhood death is really childhood cancer. So in high income countries, Canada, the United States, Western Europe, Childhood cancer is by far and away the leading disease cause, disease related cause of death. And so it becomes more and more common across the world as infectious causes come under control. For example, in upper middle income countries, the latest estimates are that over 20% of childhood mortality, especially mortality between five and 14 years of age is due to cancer. And if you think about it, that includes the vast pediatric populations of China, of parts of India, of Brazil. So we really are talking about a major, major burden in these countries, a burden that's only going to increase over the next several decades. So if we're not putting in the programs to control childhood cancer now, we're just saving up a tsunami of cases um, to be dealt with in the future. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's similar in what, what Helen was saying, the fact that, you know, it, the rates are continuing to go up, people are going to be aging, and if we don't do anything now, we're not going to get a handle on it. So that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about interventions for cancer. This volume is put together an essential package for cancer interventions, and the majority of them that are included address cancers that, had, um, that contributed to about two thirds of the, all of cancer deaths. This includes cancers of the lung, mouth, esophagus, which a lot are called by, caused by tobacco. Um, also cancers of the liver due to hepatitis B, stomach, uh, breast cancer, cervical cancer, which is due to the viral, the viral HPV, um, and colon or rectum. Now, these interventions that are included focus on prevention, screening, diagnosis, and treatment, and palliative care for cancer. Now, when we're talking about prevention interventions, we're talking about uh, in scaling up the birth dose of hepatitis B immunizations, increasing HPV vaccination, and tobacco control. And specifically, tobacco excise taxes are highlighted as a very cost-effective solution. Helen, can you explain how this works? <laughs> sure. Um, well, intuitively, a lot of people think that taxing tobacco is regressive in that it hurts the poor more than the rich, and, and people don't like to do that. Um, but in fact, um, for an individual, and that's true for the individual person who's buying more cigarettes, and if they don't cut back their cigarettes or quit, then yes, it's going to be a higher percentage of the income of a poor person than a rich person. But if you look at the population level, it turns out that people are very sensitive to price, and it's a very powerful incentive to quit smoking, and it's more powerful if you're poor than if you're rich. If you're rich, well, you can buy the cigarettes. It doesn't really affect anything. But in fact, it really does um, encourage more poor people both to quit smoking and 
for young people not to start smoking because it's just expensive. Um, so society gains for because um, there are fewer people smoking and uh, fewer lower income people die from smoking than than at lower prices. So also the the taxes still generate extra money that can be used to for health or other priorities. So in fact, it's considered a progressive tax. That makes a lot of sense, Helen. But what about childhood cancer? Where do we stand for preventing childhood cancer or even screening for it? Uh, so there are, with very rare exceptions, no effective prevention or screening programs for childhood cancer. Frankly, unlike most adult cancers, we really have no idea why the vast majority of cases of childhood cancer occur. So there's really no way to prevent them. Um, and as I said, with very, very rare exceptions, there are no screening programs that have been effective. So really, if you're talking about controlling childhood cancer, you really are talking about treating childhood cancer as it arises. Got it. Well, let me follow up on that, Sumit. Um, if, you know, so we're controlling is going to require treatment at the moment. But what about research efforts? If we don't understand, would you suggest maybe we focus or we scale up our, our research into understanding the development of childhood cancer? So I think it's important to, to mention as well that in high income countries, the cure rates for childhood cancer as a large group is 80%. So, you know, it's important for listeners to realize that just because we don't know the causes of childhood cancer, that doesn't mean that we haven't done actually a spectacular job in high income countries of learning how to effectively treat it. Childhood cancer or cancers are some of the most curable ones out there. You are right that research, further research into the causes of childhood cancer are necessary, but they're not necessary to continue the treatment as well. And, and obviously screening is really important um, because obviously without an accurate, diagnos accurate diagnosis, um, you can't treat anybody because they're not getting diagnosed. Uh, but there's a short of pathologists and, and also facilities and equipment that are needed for it in a lot of low and middle income uh, places. Where do you see opportunities to improve this and how? So in pediatric cancer, like really in all cancer, accurate diagnosis is everything. Um, and that presents a major challenge in many low and middle income countries for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the human expertise may or may not be present. And secondly, the laboratory reagents and com uh, consumables necessary to make the diagnosis may also not be present. Um, However, there have been some really interesting and exciting ways that people have gotten around these things. Telepathology has been shown to work in many different settings. And even just having referral and diagnosis networks across a jurisdiction or a country. In Kenya, for example, they've built a diagnosis network specifically for retinoblastoma, which is a type of childhood eye cancer. It's rare and the diagnosis can be complicated um, and so there is a network such that the diagnosis of retinoblastoma is centralized across the country. So the challenges are immense, but, but many jurisdictions have actually done some really creative um, uh, thinking to come up with solutions to that challenge. That's really great to hear. Now, also pa palliative care is another important area with regard to cancer. Um, pain control through opioid administration is a big part of this, but what I learned from reading the, the volume is that this is largely unavailable in many countries. For example, 66% of the world's population um, lives in countries that has virtually no consumption of, of opioids. Um, this is interesting, you know, because we do have access here in the United States. Uh, and I want to ask um, you guys, why is this? And how do we work to improve access to opioid medication for cancer patients around the world? Well, if I could start, uh, yeah, I mean, we hear about the opioid crisis every day in the United States, but it's a very, very different one than, than what we're hearing about, than what we know about in poor countries, which you never hear about uh, in the news. Um, and it, it just makes it even harder, though, because the main reason that opioids, like morphine, it's oral morphine that's really needed in uh, cancer pain um, 
uh, governments are very concerned about about addiction and uh, and illicit use of opioids, and it's basically, you know, taken control of the licit, the, the needed opioid um, morphine availability in these countries. There are groups that have been working for decades, really, to try to improve the situation. And, and in some countries, it, it's slowly improving, but it's one of the most difficult areas, really, uh, to work on. Sumit, maybe you have some other ideas. Yeah, I look, the opioid crisis in, in Western countries, including Canada, is dramatic and tragic and, and is a true emergency. There is no question. Mm -hmm. And has many factors, one of which is the overprescription of opioids in, in high-income countries or some high-income countries. But it's really important to remember that any medical or government agencies that has talked about the overprescription of opioid for pain control always makes an exception for cancer related pain. Opioids still, even in high income countries, are a major weapon in our fight against cancer related pain. And so there is a real danger that already um, existing stigma against opioids in low middle income countries for any use whatsoever is going to be exacerbated by the current crisis of overprescription for non-cancer related pain that's happening in high income countries. That, that's a very subtle distinction to, to non-experts and to lay people. Um, so, so that's going to take some really strong efforts from advocates and, uh, and healthcare practitioners around the world to make sure that those two things aren't conflated because they're both opioid crises. They're just completely opposite in the populations uh, affected and in the directions they're going. Absolutely. So let's talk about costs and how much it's going to cost to really address cancer on a global level. The DCP essential package for cancer control of interventions would cost roughly between um, US dollars, two to six dollars per capita for low and middle income countries. And then this would be with an annual cost of about $20 billion. Now this is about three to 5% of health spending in middle income countries and about 13% in low income countries. Now for the middle income countries, this isn't a lot, but it's more than some of them are actually spending. For instance, in places like Brazil, India, China, and Mexico, they only spend one to 2% of the health budget on cancer control. So how do we get low and middle income countries to finance cancer control and implement the essential cancer package? Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely aspirational. Um, but except for the low income countries with, with budgeting and incorporating some cancer services into universal health coverage and progressively adding more, we can envision building up facilities and the human resources over the next couple of decades. For most countries, it's going to require some domestic funding. Um, the Ministry of Finance, working with the Ministry of Health, is going to have to find that money. Um, also attracting external funding, which you know does occur somewhat already. Um, and partnering with institutions from rich countries. Now, this is something that's been going on for decades and has increased quite a bit. And there, Sumit might have some good examples in the uh, pediatric side, but it's a bit of chicken and egg. I mean, you need increased demand will lead to increased services and it goes on from there, but it is gonna take decades just to build up the human resources as, as Sumit was just even about pathology, but it's everything. It's all of the specialties and the institution building. So we can build the budget as we build the uh, resources. Well, what about pediatric cancer? Would you say that it's, it's too expensive to treat in low middle income countries? Yeah, so that's another misconception that many, many people have. Um, I think there's a couple of things about childhood cancer that actually make it very cost effective, in fact. So first of all, as I alluded to before, cure rates are very, very high, right? Um, and treatments are gener generally of very defined and sometimes very limited duration, and those are still associated with high cure rates. Uh, the other factor is that the vast majority of drugs and chemotherapies used for treatment of childhood cancer 
are 30 to 50 years old. So these are not, you know, highly expensive patented medications that are um, very expensive to procure. So one example, for example, is Burkitt's lymphoma, which is the most ch common childhood cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, which untreated obviously has a 0% survival rate. There's excellent evidence from multiple centers across sub-Saharan Africa that with three to six uh, doses of a very cheap generic drug called cyclophosphamide at the cost of about $50, you can cure half of those kids. Now that does not take into account costs associated with the medical services and nursing and infrastructure and things like that. So I don't want to you know, say it's going to only cost $50 to cure a child. But even when you bring all of those in, we're still talking about a very cheap intervention and one that then saves the child who would have died at, say, five years of uh, age, who can then go on to have essentially a normal lifespan. So when you put all of those things together, in, in almost every setting, there is some sort of treatment for some childhood cancers that will be appropriate to that setting. Right. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you talk about like the kind of the health delivery costs that not, not aren't necessarily specific to cancer. Now, granted, there are some of them, but you know, look, we're talking about this all over the place about building up health systems, and that's not just going to benefit cancer, and it's it's going to benefit a lot of other ones. So, I think it's important to point out which are particularly disease specific costs, and and pointing out that a lot of some of the disease cancer specific costs are pretty cost effective, or are aren't as much as you think they were, if health systems were in a stronger place for some places. Absolutely. So, I also want to talk about all right, where do we go from here? And kind of talking about maybe, you know, leveraging the role of philanthropy. I mean, we're just talking about financing and maybe how that could get involved. Um, you know, at, at the global level, only 1% of the U.S. $30 billion development um, dollars for development for assistance for health in 2010 was allocated to NCDs. Um, and only a portion of that uh, went to cancer. So where do you think we go from here with, with regard to the next steps for cancer control at the global level? Well, we clearly need to do a better job in awareness raising and what the opportunities really are. Um, and the also the fact that, you know, we can put it off for another decade, but it's not going to get any cheaper. In fact, it's just going to get more expensive and it's still going to take a long time. So the best advertising is spotlighting programs that work, and these may be these collaborative programs between major cancer centers in in Western countries and in uh, in low and middle income countries, um, and people being treated and saved. And that one of the the big areas where you see this is in in breast cancer. There are you know it's probably the most visible uh, people being saved all over the world. But it also doesn't hurt if. Uh, they're cute kids being saved. Yeah, that, that's definitely an advantage we have in, in the child <laughs> realm. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. The, the best way to raise awareness is to show examples of success. You know, and the, the example that always comes to mind whenever I talk about this aspect of things is in Guatemala, actually, where over the past 20, maybe even 25 years now, a tremendously successful childhood cancer center was established in Guatemala through the efforts of some really committed and passionate people um, and have managed to show really impressive improvements in cure rates. But what I find most interesting is the number of children they are referred from across the country and how that has skyrocketed over the last 15 years. And it's because as you cure these children, they re-enter their communities and societies and more and more people have the experience of not just knowing that cancer exists in a child or can exist in a child but that it can be successfully treated and so the mother or the father or the local leader or the family doctor or the village nurse thinks about the kid two villages over who was successfully cured of their leukemia and so thinks about a child might have leukemia and knows where to refer them. 
And in addition, the awareness at a broader societal level increases as well. So there's more acceptance about, hey, childhood cancer or cancer in general can be cured. So maybe we should be building up our infrastructure and allotting more resources towards this so that we can cure even more people. That's really uplifting you here. It makes a lot of sense. You know, I didn't even think about it from the awareness, building more about knowing about that there, these interventions are available for in general, but like really at that local level and showing kids that have been treated and making sure that, you know, individuals know that where they can go for treatment and, and seeing it and, and having those success stories in front of them and living with it. So that's, thanks for pointing that out. Now, I want to get back a little bit to the research side of things because I thought this was interesting when I went um, read a little bit of the volume and saying that actually we don't have a whole lot of data and research to understand um, well with regard to cancer interventions in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Uh, that was surprising to me. And but I, I want to turn this over to you, Summit, because the Sick Kids of Initiative, which you're involved in, um, is a move in that direction, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. And I have to say, I have to I have to thank the DCP process itself for for converting me uh, and convincing me about the importance of this kind of stuff. I still remember I, I'm a clinician first and foremost. And so when I was asked to be involved with the DCP cancer volume uh, by Helen and others and sort of gave my spiel about childhood cancer, you know, all these other folks sort of looked at me, including Helen and said, OK, but how much does it cost? So, so, well, I have no idea. So, well, <laughs> is it cost effective? Like, yep, I have no idea about that either. And, and no one does. And it, you know, I think the great thing about um, this kind of research and what Helen and others like her do it is show how crucial that kind of data is to policymakers and to government officials in order to actually be able to um, build these programs and build appropriate programs. So with that knowledge, we we started something at SickKids called the uh, Unit for Policy and Economics Research in Childhood Cancer, or PERC for short, um, really to try to fill that gap and to start create, bringing together health economists and health policy experts and childhood cancer experts to really conduct research um, in that field. And, and we've already done some really neat stuff. So we've conducted some cost-effective studies in El Salvador, in Ghana. We have one ongoing in Jordan right now. And for example, the studies that we've just completed in El Salvador and Ghana have shown that if you look at an intervention being a childhood cancer treatment unit itself, as opposed to one specific disease protocol, treat, uh, treatment protocol or, or such, but the broader intervention mention, it by far and away meets uh, criteria for being considered very cost effective by WHO choice methodology and threshold. So even just that is really, really important. And as I can finish with just one quick example, you know, when we had our preliminary results from Ghana, our colleagues and collaborators in Ghana immediately have started to make plans on how to take that information to their Ministry of Health to convince them that childhood cancer should be included in the conditions covered by their universal health care scheme. So I think that's just a very, very simple yet incredibly potentially impactful example of how this kind of research, you know, above and beyond the straight clinical or clinical treatment research really can have major impacts uh, on a population level. That's really great to hear and interesting to hear how, like you said, where you started from having to say, actually, we don't know if it's cost effective, but then finding out indeed it is and then being able to see that that information go to policymakers and then get it used. That's, you know, as someone, um, you know, in the global health world, it's it's nice to hear those stories. And well, I mean, who doesn't like a good success story, right? They, they haven't said yes. <laughs> so I, shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't preempt it, but, but that's the hope. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I have one final question for for you guys. What do you think, briefly, are the major challenges going forward with cancer control worldwide? Well, if I could start, I, I just going back to um, awareness and your very beginning, how people still believe that cancer is basically a, a rich person's disease, and even with the new preventive um, vaccines and all. Cancer is just, and, and as, as Sumit pointed out, it's not just children who's, uh, who are being um, 
who are being saved from death from infectious disease, it's adults, it's the whole population. So as more and more people are not dying from infection, they're dying from non-commutable diseases and cancer, uh, e we have even better methods of treating and preventing deaths from heart disease, but cancer, you know, we, we, we've got pretty good treatment for a lot of diseases, but we just need to, to, to get it out there to more people. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, it's a PR, it's a PR uh, challenge, I think, to a large extent. I couldn't agree more. I think if enough people knew that cancer was a major issue in low middle income countries, and that with the appropriate resourcing and treatment, it was curable, then people would advocate for themselves to get the resources and the infrastructure to make that happen. So I think it all is, as Helen said, dependent on that first step of really pushing that message that this is a problem, but it's a problem that is able to be overcome. And I want to point out, you know, Helen, I, I read one of your blogs in which you called surgery, or sorry, not surgery. That's funny because what, you know, we did a surgery episode last time and surgery was called the neglected stepchild of global health. But Helen, in the blog that I, of yours that I read, you argue that cancer is equally neglected. So it sounds like this is really, like you guys say, really a lot of the challenge is the awareness and um, some of the, and overcoming the misconceptions that people have about, about cancer. Right. Well, you know, it's neglected enough. I think I think we can all agree on that. But um, just also to mention that surgery, in fact, is a vital component of cancer treatment. Yeah. And so the fact that surgery is also neglected hurts cancer. Uh, in in the history of cancer treatment, far more patients, especially adult patients, have been cured by surgery alone than um, any other treatment. You know, that's just, uh, if you find cancer early, which is, a, you know, certainly our best way of treating it, many, many cancers are have been cured by just surgery. So we need both. Well, I think it's a great place to end this talking about, you know, it being neglected. And what we're doing here is trying to raise more awareness about, about cancer through the, you know, through this episode and through the, the specific DCP3 volume on cancer. Um, so I want to I want to say thank you to Sumit and Helen for chatting with me today. I've um, you know I read the volume, but now this is even more. I've learned more, and it's I, I'm leaving today with a with a more positive attitude towards to what we can do towards cancer control globally. So thank you for sharing your personal insight um, and stories on that. And to our audience members. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, let us know what you think about this episode um, by commenting on the video, or you can tweet at us. And we really hope that you enjoyed this episode and you want to check out more of our videos by subscribing to our YouTube channel, which um, you can also find videos on our webpage as well. And you can also find out more about us there. And we're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we have a blog. And for those of you that prefer to listen rather than watch, you're in luck because we also have a purely audio podcast and yeah, check us out there as well. You can find us through uh, iTunes. So that's it for today. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sumit and Helen, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.